Hello and welcome to uh, the final panel of the amazing uh, Implementing a Just Transition uh, conference that Parkland's been putting on. I'm happy to have been able to observe uh, some of it from where I am. Uh, today I'm actually in, uh, phoning in from Toronto. Um, usually I am joining these meetings from Treaty 6, uh, a little closer to where we're hosting the event, so I'll, I will represent myself as a true Saskatchewanian and be from there. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with this excellent panel uh, basically sharing how the workers uh, can help and our, what workers' concerns are in this in this uh, struggle and conversation ahead about address transition. I have some excellent speakers for you, and I know you've had a long afternoon, but I hope we're going to put some fire into everyone after this and have a great opportunity to, to share some more views and hear from you on your excellent uh, point. And the first who will kick us off is uh, Lyle W. Daniels from the uh, Building Trades of Alberta. Uh, and Lyle's the new uh, Community and Indig Indigenous Director with uh, Building Trades. He comes from George Gordon First Nation in Treaty 4 and recently moved into Treaty 6 territory for his new role with the BTA. George, uh, Lyle is the National Chair of the National Indigenous Diabetes Association and was recently appointed as the Co-Chair of the Equity Working Group with the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum. And Lyle has a lot more he can share with us, so I'll Pass it over to Lyle. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a big honor to be amongst some awesome speakers that I was able to hear already. Um, Lyle Daniels, originally born and raised in Regina. Uh, the reality of being an Indigenous person growing up in Canada in the prairies is uh, the background of who we are. I'm, I'm, I'm Cree. My, my, my mother uh, was Cree. My father was Cree Métis. Um, my mother went to a uh, residential school, so I'm that first generation coming from um, a, a residential school experience. My father um, drank himself to death when he was 43 years of age. And you're going to find in many cases, many cases, a large number of our Indigenous population have gone through an incredible amount of uh, hardship. And, but you know what? The one thing I love about my community and the Indigenous community is we've always been survivalists. And, and when we go back in history and we talk about green energy, we talk about uh, just transition, we, if we go back thousands and thousands of years in, on Turtle Island in, in North America, we begin to realize that we were always, the Indigenous peoples were always the stewards of the land. We only took what we needed and, uh, and we left whatever was out there for the next generation. And I think when you look at that, we need to think of the Indigenous community in that way, that they're always going to have that attitude, that attitude towards the land. Now, saying that, we also need to think about how we want to prepare workers. And as much as I work for the Building Trades of Alberta, just started this awesome job in, 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 since, since October, gone to a number of the First Nations and Métis communities in, in Alberta already, um, there is a tremendous amount of talent out there. And uh, for us to start thinking, temporary foreign workers, bringing people from all over the place to, to, to look at um, um, taking on the, the work that's going to be re required for not only um, solar, wind, and, uh, and, and, and our ju just transition profile, but in anything that, that, that we do, we need to develop the, the existing workforce that's in place right now. And the only way we can start thinking about that to start to developing and helping the, our young population uh, of, of Indigenous people in, in, in Alberta and figure out how we can get them to a point where they become a part of a, a very important workforce in Alberta. And that's what I'm here to, to share with you today. Um, I would like to show a short little video that's going to give all of us a better understanding where we need to start focusing our young people and getting them to start thinking about a, a path forward. When you're a kid, life is endless, you know? Life is limitless. We'd skate till 10 o'clock in the summer times. We'd bike till 10 o'clock, just running away from family. And I remember uh, honestly pretty much breaking the rules. I mean, it was a big lesson for me to, when you gotta be done something, you gotta be done. And you know, there's a time when you gotta stop and, and uh, do what's right. I honestly didn't think I'd make it to, to today. I don't know, honestly, I didn't think I'd make it to 20. A lot of my friends growing up, just that whole like mentality, you know, just they're bored. They have nothing to do. They have no guidance. What are they gonna do? And when they're lost and alone with no guidance, with no goals or anything, and you tell them every day like you're worthless, you're stupid, you're you're nothing. 
You're facing pain every single day of your young life thinking you can never leave. This is life. This is what it's always going to be. So you want to numb it. You don't want to you don't want to live through that. You know, when I was at those parties, everyone was always trying to give me extra or or, you know, go play this game, do this, you know, it's something that's out of the ordinary. And I'm like, ah, that's not me. I don't need that in my life. You know, if you don't think I'm I'm cool and all, that's cool, but I know you'll think I'm cool on the ice. I just didn't want to be a statistic, you know. It felt kind of like I left a lot of people behind, and you get that guilt because there's nothing you can do. They need to want it, and I wanted it. My brother wanted it. My mom wanted it. Taking it one step at a time is, is practical, it's real, and we can take big strides just having that philosophy in mind when it comes to helping our young people or helping our families. Just move forward. Like, there's so much to, in this life to live for and to experience that, you know, you don't, you don't need that extra, that extra distraction. Anyone ever, ever asks me about, why would you want to go into trades? Like, who showed you that? My mom, she was the strongest woman I've ever, ever met. Women like her paved the way for women like me to get into trades. The best things in life come from just helping people. You know, there's so many opportunities and so many jobs. You can be whoever you want. Houses on First Nations is currently unsustainable for 99% of First Nations. Let's think outside the box on how we can build 100 homes. Can I bring the trades opportunities, as opposed to them going off the nation, on the nation? And by the way, maybe we can build houses outside the reserve for other people. If I didn't play hockey, I think about like carpentry, like with my cousins. Like I don't see, I might be, even be a carpenter, probably, or a plumber, just having around, like you know, like my grandpa. Like, or, heck, like I'd do that stuff for them all day if I wanted to. And, you know, I'd be with people I care about and get some work done. So I chose this. I chose this trade, I chose this life. I chose to associate myself with these people because I knew I could, I could do better. My path forward was hockey. My path forward is helping people. My path forward was the skilled trades. The one glaring thing that I always want to share with people when I, when, I, when I show that video is that we need to help young people develop that path forward. And we also need to, as corporations who are developing just transition, companies need to look at the Indigenous community, just not for, for construction, but also for all of those career opportunities that, that, that will allow them to be a part of it as well. And for, for example, we need to go to the University of, of Alberta. We need to go to the First Nations University of Canada. Look at the engineers. Look at all the other opportunities for Indigenous people to be a part of this world. And, 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 and we, so, it's, so it's not just construction. And, and, and even though I love showing this video, I, I, I love showing the fact that, that, that when it comes to uh, uh, being able to um, share some stories of, of, of some, some cool young people, for example, Jasmine Smith comes from the Bagani uh, First Nation in Southern Alberta. She, at the time, was a, uh, an apprentice uh, iron worker. And since then, and this video was done two years ago, COVID hit just when we did this and it stopped our, our sort of our, our path forward um, uh, uh, work that we wanted to do, stopped it in its tracks. But still, that didn't stop her. She is now a, a Red Seal um, iron worker. Um, uh, that, that is currently uh, working in South, Southern Alberta. Strong Indigenous woman. And, and so we need to not only look at the opportunities for construction, but what can we do to, to start educating and start bringing in a good chunk of our young people, both off and on reserve? Because there's a difference between how our young people live on reserve versus, versus off reserve. And we need to understand that we need to do things differently with, with, with each group. Now, it also means there's an incredible amount of opportunity here too. But the one thing I don't like is when our, our people are used for labor. It's my goal, my lifelong goal when it comes to working for now for the Building Trades of Alberta, if there's opportunities for our young people to be uh, given opportunities to, to, to work, it has to be an apprenticeship. It has to be in, in, in a career and not just used for labor. Uh, in many cases, even solar energy and, and, and any of the green energy, our people are used to go build that and they're paid you know, $18 an hour to, to, to do that. In many cases, they have to drive a long distance to be able to do that.
And so they're, they're spending that much amount of gas to go do the work for one day, drive back, and instead try to develop our young people to be able to make them part of the, part of the system and make them uh, a part of the, uh, the whole just transition attitude. And I'm tired of companies saying, you know, I, I can't find any good people nowadays. Well, you know what? Come talk to Lyle W. Daniels and I'll find them for you. Or I know I can go into every single community, any single community in Alberta, and I can find the people for you. And uh, and and too often, it's it's a cop out for for companies to uh, to do that. And uh, we just need to do it properly, have a good plan in place, but more importantly, have the young people's heart and mind when it comes to uh, ensuring that we help them. And uh, the only thing that's going to help us in the long run is we're going to keep people off the streets. We're going to keep people out of jails. We're going to keep uh, drugs uh, away from our, our young people. If we give young people an opportunity to be part of a society and in a positive, big honor to be here. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll thank you so much for sharing that, uh, not only the moving video, but everything you said. I think we are not going away and we're going to have more time to dig into those uh, those issues. So don't worry. I'm going to come right back to you as soon as we can. And I've been scribbling notes madly. Very interesting points there. Uh, the interesting phrase about being used for labor is one I'd love to explore a little more. And we are a panel of labor, of organized labor here, and, and those that don't want to see anyone used, but actually have people work uh, and be paid for the work that they do. And uh, next on our list is uh, Meg Gingrich, who is the assistant to the national director of the United Steelworkers uh, in Canada. Uh, Meg is also the president of Blue Green Canada. So disclaimer or disclosure, I tend to agree with what Meg says. Meg has new in that role, but not new in activism or uh, engaging on labor rights or environmental rights. And I know I had another bio, Meg, but I'm just going to roll with it from there and pass it off to you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I am coming to you today from Scarborough, Ontario, which is the uh, traditional territory of many nations, including the this is the sagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, and although I am now located in Scarborough, I did grow up in Saskatchewan and Regina uh, as well. So I do, it's like at least closer to Alberta. So there's that, but uh, so a bunch of us have the Saskatchewan connection. And anyway, just to get into it. So uh, just transition, um, you know, action on climate change, all of that is something that's very close to home to many of our members. We are the steel workers, but we do represent workers in virtually every sector of the economy. Um, some who are much more distant from sort of high emissions industries or oil and gas, um, but of course would still be affected by um, climate change. Um, but we do have members who are, you know, build the pipe for pipelines, um, we have some members in coal, um, not too many anymore. And then, of course, in a lot of high emissions industries like steel, aluminum, uh, and so on, various, you know, across manufacturing. So this is something that's very important to us. We do um, recognize the need for action on climate change. Our main message is that it needs to work for workers. Um, that probably seems obvious, but uh, we can't emphasize that enough. And every time we get the chance to sort of try to influence policy um, or even sort of workplace action. Um, that's something that we have to really, really fight for all the time. As much as we hear that sometimes from politicians or there's some sort of lip service paid to it, um, our experience is uh, that often workers are an afterthought or um, sometimes used to make something sound good um, but aren't really as involved as they need to be. Those of you who are in Alberta are probably you know, well-versed in the, the coal phase out um, that did directly affect our members. I'm not going to get into that one so much today. If anyone's interested to find out more about our local union's experience in that, please go check out um, Roy Milne, the former local union president, the, the local union president, um, was very, very active on behalf of that local so I urge people to go look at some of the work he's done. I want to raise one sort of example that is from Ontario about that I think highlights the need for worker involvement, um, both in terms of ensuring that um, when we take action on climate change and emissions and so on, you have to have the workers involved in order to get better material outcomes for the workers, but also in terms of getting worker support for action on climate change. I find that sometimes the narrative is that, oh, uh, energy workers or oil and gas workers or the, the people making the pipe for pipelines uh, don't get it or, or, you know, like they just, they don't care about the climate, they don't care about the environment. 
Um, I don't think that that's further from the truth. I think that there are legitimate fears of job loss, of uh, losing communities, uh, and so on. And so we always try to, you know, as best we can, say that, hey, workers need to be involved. Um, so I do want to talk about a recent example in Sault Ste. Marie, where um, there was a, ma a major government investment announced um, earlier this year in the summer. So the investment was um, kind of came out of nowhere. The union wasn't told about it. The locals weren't to told about it. But um, at Algoma Steel, there was an announcement for a $420 million investment to retrofit the operations and to phase out the coal-fired steelmaking process. And this was touted as it's something that on the surface, you know, they, the government announcement was it's going to create 500 jobs. It's going to be great. It's going to help uh, keep steelmaking uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, it's been the pillar of the community for, for decades. Um, and it seemed on the surface like it was a good news story. But um, the local union there wasn't informed. Um, and while the overall um, job creation may have been 500 jobs at some point, there will be people who lose their jobs. There are people who currently work there who have certain skills and those jobs will be lost. And so the reaction immediately was just, you know, it, it was a really negative one. And it just seems like something that would have been so easy uh, had the union been consulted from the beginning um, to turn this into something that really did include workers to say, hey, uh, we're going to make this investment into an electric arc furnace um, that reduces emissions significantly. It has the potential to create long-term jobs in the community. Um, and so we want to work with the local. Uh, there's two, actually two locals there. So with the locals, uh, with the district, the national, uh, all of that to ensure the best possible outcome. And that does mean some things, you know, it includes bargaining on, uh, you know, what happens to the affected workers, the ones who are negatively affected. Um, will they, you know, have, be able to access their full pensions when they retire? Will they be able to stay along? Will there be retraining opportunities? All of these things. And um, so none of these things were discussed. And then after the local, um, the one local that was just like, hey, this isn't necessarily going to be positive for us. The company and the, the government sort of said, okay, now we do need to negotiate. They kind of realized, I think, the mistake. But at that point, the damage was really done. And so of the two locals that are there, one of them is working with the employer to try to get the best possible outcome, but one is still not. And, you know, um, it's just such a missed opportunity. And it just shows that um, as much as if you read the sort of the press release on it, it tells the, you know, the importance for, uh, for job growth and all of these things but the union wasn't involved. And it just, um, it's something that I can't emphasize enough that at every level, whether it's through collective bargaining or some type of bargaining at the, uh, you know, with the union and the employer um, to whatever, you know, we could get into sort of a policy discussion about the need for industrial policy and uh, different types of action that's taken at, uh, you know, the municipal and the provincial and the federal level and even the international level. And we may get into some of that um, in our discussion, but uh, you know what I think that you know what workers really need—they need to be involved. They have to have clear, like, material outcomes that are going to show that they're going to be able to feed their families and keep a similar job, have retraining opportunities, um, and that actually getting the workers involved doesn't just turn into another buzzword. That it's not used for sort of cynical. Uh, political purposes to make something or someone sound good or sound like they care. Um, you know, we need to have real concrete things in there, minimizing the loss of pay, loss of pension, um, and retraining opportunities with jobs that are actually tied to those uh, retraining opportunities um, that help support communities. Like a lot of the, uh, the places with our membership where we see uh, a threat to jobs, um, a potential threat to jobs, if there is action on um, reducing emissions. Um, there's smaller communities that are very reliant on a single industry or on a couple of industries. And so I think that it's, you know, it's people have very, very legitimate fears. And so it's partly taking workers seriously. Uh, and I imagine people who are here today kind of already do, but I think that the sort of larger narrative is one often of um, that I hear is, 
is one that's sort of contemptuous and that workers just they don't they don't care about the environment or uh, they're trying to maintain industries that are really harmful and all of these things and it's like no people just want to keep their jobs and they want to have stable employment and um if you don't um get worker buy-in from the very 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 first stage it can really just go astray and, and policies that could have been good or investments that could have been good um end up not getting the support that they need. I mean, I do wanna just emphasize the need for comprehensive approaches to just transition the, so that it is at you know, everywhere from the local to the international levels. Um, if we do get into a policy discussion, we can go more into all of that and I think can may address some of those things as well. Um, but policy cohesion, like right now, it's just, I can't tell you all how many times I've been in sort of government consultations where we're starting at the same basic point. Um, on all of this and there's different agencies doing uh, just transition consultations and things like that and they don't seem to be communicating with each other um, there's various levels in this federal system and all of those things uh, really need to come together um, we need to find ways to bring those together and include workers at every single level great points in particular something i want to elevate that we'll talk about a bit more likely but is this concept of just abstract job growth that's supposed to make everyone feel better um, you know, when you're someone who's working in a factory and you have a job at the, mo at the moment, if someone comes along and says, there's going to be great jobs in the future, but there's no path for them to be part of it, it's really not that much of a hand up at all. It's just uh, papering over what's about to happen to those actual people. So uh, very good point there. Now we're going to talk about Ken, Ken Bondi, who is, well, the national representative from Unifor in the health for health, safety and environment. He's uh, the Unifor, of course, I think people would have known is the largest private sector union in Canada with more than 30, 315,000 uh, members in every different sector of the Canadian economy. Ken comes from the auto background. He worked in the Ford Motor Company engine and casting plants in Ontario, uh, I think most specifically in the Windsor, Ontario area, and he's represented workers in various capacities for 34 years. I'm sure you haven't updated that 34 years in a while, Ken. I'm sure it's even longer than that. And uh, of course, I can joke with Ken because he's on my board as well, and I, I hope he will still remain on my board after I make some more fun of him today. But um, Ken, I'm going to ask you to take take it away and, and share your perspective on this issue, and, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And um, I'm going to try to make some points. I'll pick up uh, uh, probably where some of the stuff that Meg left off on. And uh, But before they do that, I do want to recognize that uh, I am Zooming you from the Toronto Treaty 13 territory uh, and the Mississaugas of the credit. So just to get into the, the details of the worker aspects of this just transition, I know that uh, this last day and a half, everybody's been on this conference. We've heard a lot of uh, good documented research materials from uh, the very smart folks that we certainly rep, uh, respect and appreciate that do all of that research stuff that we rely on. Uh, and having said that, it's important for us to make uh, a couple of things very clear. And, and the most clear thing we can make uh, to everybody, whether it's researchers, whether it's government, whether it's corporations, and, and to go back to kind of what Meg was saying is that I can only say this, if you are looking at just transition and seriously looking at making a change and you do not have a worker involved in that discussion, then you're doing it wrong because this just transition process is about the effects on workers. So how can you discuss and theorize about how it's going to affect workers if you don't have those workers at the table. And on that particular theme, uh, we in, in 2019, we Unifor had our first and only conference on just transition because then we were capped from the COVID restrictions, but we had 150 people all across our union, all sectors, all different jobs come together and hear what workers had to say were the important things to be dealt with and what they wanted to see out of a true 
just transition process. And the important thing that came out of that was not only just listening to what workers themselves are concerned about, are fearful about, are apprehensive about, but maybe also uh, are somehow hopeful about, is that we did not enter into, enter into any discussions that divided us. We were not divided by sectors. We were not divided by provinces. We were workers coming together to look after fellow workers. And uh, our plan still is to this day that we are want to travel across this country and hold smaller town hall meetings with workers, not just uniform workers, workers uh, in those communities that are going to be mostly affected. And of course, when we talk about that, we're talking about Fort McMurray, we're talking about Edmonton, we're talking about all of our uh, oil and gas workers that are out on our West Coast that are going to deal with that. But we also are dealing with the same situations right across this country, from still the challenges in the fisheries on the East Coast and the West Coast, the auto industry in Ontario, uh, the challenges of polluting jobs that take place in Saskatchewan, Manitoba. We are all as workers going to be affected by this stuff, but we have to be united in doing that. The one thing that uh, we want to make sure, and this is where time is running out, is that it's not going to be easy to flip these industries uh, in a matter of a year or two. I know that a lot of our environmental friends are anxious and think that things are moving too slow. And perhaps you're correct, but the slowest thing that is taking place right now is that the federal government is doing nothing. They made a commitment to have a Just Transition Act. That was 2019. Nothing has occurred since that time. And we need to move on that. And I'm gonna wrap my discussions further on that we need to take some actions as a coalition of environmental activists as uh, workers to start pushing this along. Uh, there's always got to be an excuse. We don't have time to do this. There's COVID. We had to call another federal election. Enough of that. We need to get the work done and let's get serious. If we want to start to see a real transition process happen, we're going to do that. And the reason or the way that we're going to do that in our belief is that not only do we need a just transition act, but we need a just transition minister to look after that act. It's incredibly interesting to me that in the past few days, uh, when the Emergency and Measures Act was put into place, that magically, along with that act, uh, we had a minister named as the Emergency Actions Minister. So the idea that it can't be done is not true. We need a minister, we need a ministry, and we need an act, and we need it now. And there's no reason that the federal government should be delaying this, and the debates should be over. One of the things that we want to do when we bring that ministry together is that, of course, we want a roundtable. We want to bring unions, workers, corporations, government, all three levels of government that have to come together and have this discussion on how we're going to do this and do it effectively. And one of the things that I've talked about in the past that uh, could set a good baseline for that is the actual Green Energy and Economy Act that was enacted in Ontario in 2009. That act was a bold opportunity to bring together green investment, local procurement, investment, employing workers in new industries, solar, wind, geothermal. And it was killed, of course, by the World Trade Organization. And from that day that that happened, I have encouraged provinces across this country to look at their own Green Economy Act and to hell with the WTO. And Canada needs to hold on to their sovereignty 
uh, that we are going to do things that are going to employ Canadians and we're going to get this transition done uh, and we're going to secure investments in Canada. The, the other thing that I wanted to talk on is that we need to do uh, our own work as a labor movement is that we, and this has been talked about uh, this, this last couple of days, we need to bargain just transition language into our collective agreements. What does that look like? It's about, for instance, in our oil and gas sectors, that collective agreement language is say that people, uh, workers will be retained once those industries close, that they will be retained to do the reclamation work, the decommissioning work, to re-green those facilities. There are years of opportunities for jobs to be done. And finally, the last part of what I wanted to talk about is the unconventional ideas that we need to embrace because we're always hold, holding to uh, saying corporations can't do this, you can't do that, we can't make those things. Unconventional ideas like we need government legislation that gives minimum transition wages to people that are put out of work. That if they can give subsidies to billion dollar corporations, they sure can give subsidies to workers that are being transitioned out of work. And having said that, I wanna make this point is that moving workers into retirement is not the solution. Every time that somebody moves into retirement is a job loss for the next generation. That is not acceptable. We are already challenged with that, with the changes in technology today. And I'll go back to when I was a kid, my dad used to say to me, not everybody can be a lawyer, son. I think maybe the, the, uh, the advice today is not everybody can be a video game uh, designer, but we have to have jobs for the next industry or the next uh, century. So that's not a solution, quite frankly. It might help us in the interim to get people out of where we're looking for things, but we need to build new jobs in Canada. And finally, what I was going to say is that in that unconventional thoughts, we have all kinds of ideas that we've been discussing uh, with others within our union. Uh, end of life vehicle recovery, taking the cars, the millions of cars that are off the road as we transition to electric vehicles, dismantling them, recycling them. And that doesn't have to be all in Ontario. That can be regional factories across the country, employing people in good jobs from coast to coast to coast. Hemp production. We can grow hemp in every territory and province in Canada. It's amazing that we can do that. We may not be able to grow corn across Canada, but we can grow hemp. And the production opportunities of that, everything from clothing to oil is available for us in Canada. And Canada, by the way, is leading the way. We beat the United States on this as we changed that legislation to decriminalize industrial hemp. We have to look at those unconventional ideas to create new promising jobs for Canadians. And finally, I'll say that we have to talk to the federal government and the provinces about this disgusting approach to make organizing union workers as difficult as they can possibly legislate to be done. It's unfair, it's obviously wrong, and there should be no challenge by any government official to say that a worker does not deserve a decent living wage and benefits to do the jobs as we transition into these new sectors. And I'll leave it with that, thank you. I told you there'd be some fire on this panel. I've heard it all through. Keep everybody uh, awake and get your blood pumping out there. That's wonderful. I didn't think we'd get into hemp. That was something I didn't expect, but that's another great point. Like we need to, to look outside of the box and certainly that's just one of the many things that we'll see. I feel very inspired. I'm sitting more upright. I think this has been excellent. A lot of power shared. I see there's also been some questions flying in. So, so the question was, would you say that joint workplace environment reps are a useful tool in liaising between management, government, and workers and affecting a just transition. Now, this was from Allison, I believe, but maybe uh, those who could very briefly explain what 
that might be, and then explain if you think there's a role. Ken, I know you've worked in this area before. Could you give me like the crib, crib notes of uh, what that committee would be or and what it is in your, your shops? And it's a great question. And in 1997, the then Canadian Auto Workers Union negotiated for the first time ever, uh, I believe anywhere in the world, never mind just in Canada, joint workplace environment committees, very much similar to joint workplace health and safety committees. And the idea was uh, back in the day when people said that if you were a worker in a environmentally hazardous uh, operation, then you must be a bad person. And that's absolutely not true. And, and I think we've proven that uh, people work where they live and they take the job opportunities that they can get and they need to bring a paycheck home to live. And uh, the great thing about having union representation is that we have a voice to voice our opposition to the way uh, things are being manufactured and what is happening to the community. And so in 1997, we negotiated that opportunity to challenge the corporations to do things a better way. And the great uh, success of this is that labor uh, councils across Canada have been embracing that and have been taking that as a piece of negotiable language back to their employers and saying, it's not just good enough to put a green slogan out as an advertisement, you're going to be held accountable by the union to make sure you're doing it. So uh, it's, it's a great opportunity. It's something that we certainly encourage every labor organization across this, this country to look at putting into language. I guess it's a, sort of a more relatable version to a bit of a social dialogue that we've heard about in previous panels. It's more of a European uh, model where they just have that level of unionization, so it's hard not to do. But uh, I want to bring uh, Lyle back in because we went pretty deep on, on unionization stuff there, which is super important to bring workers through. But we also, Lyle, brought some interesting points about bringing young people into this process and the importance of apprenticeships uh, in terms of training people for actual jobs and actual work where they can have careers and not where they're just being used for their labor, as you said previously. And I'm just wondering in this conversation about ensuring that we expand who's involved in these decisions and expand who um, can be around those tables, if you know you have any uh, examples or work that you know we've done to bring young people into these conversations. So the video still inspires me that we just saw and I'm just thinking about ways to see us encouraging more of that as this transition happens. So it's not just building back, we're building into something better than where we started. And I if you don't mind, every single person that, that's listening to us right now should just take the time and look around you and find one person that you can mentor, a young indigenous person that you can mentor. Because I'll tell you, 12 years ago, and it, it, to this day, I am forever grateful. Somebody came to me and said, you know what, somebody said some, something good about you and we want, to, we want to talk to you about coming to work with us. He's my boss today, and, uh, and, and he was my boss in Saskatchewan. He, he brought me over to Alberta as much as he dragged me over here. Our people are struggling no matter where they are. Uh, so it wasn't a difficult decision for me to decide to do that. But you know what? Somebody long time ago, even before reconciliation was a word, realized that they have to do, we all have to do our part to figure out how we can bring a particular young person under our wing and take the time to mentor them and give them the opportunity to, to show what they can do. And, uh, and we're out there, we're, they're, they're out there. We just need to take that little bit of extra step to make that happen. Yeah, wonderful point. I do know of some organized ways that that can sometimes happen, but I hear you and that that may be just an individual opportunity that people should take on as well, because if you're well, in the position, you can. The, one of the biggest issues when it comes to the indigenous community is that they are so against unions. And for whatever reason, part of the reason to me from understanding it uh, and seeing it is that there's that mentality that it's the longest serving uh, person, um, most qualified that advance. But I see indigenous people with, with, with in every single unionized movement right across the country. And, and, and my attitude, even within the construction world and, and, and construction, uh, our construction unions, the way we start to, 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 to see more indigenous people 
And it's happening. People don't realize in Alberta, for example, the iron workers in, in, in all of Alberta, they, the indigenous community is 30% of the iron workers. And, and you know, it's all, so how that's entrenched is by family. How are our unions developed? By family. And so the minute we start to, to, to bring more people into, into the system, that we're gonna bring their cousins, we're gonna bring their, their nephews, we're gonna bring all of those people that see a role model doing well for themselves to be able to see this as an opportunity for, for them to do well as well. That's the reality of it. And, that, and we have to play that the best we can. So when I go to young people, they can tell me who, who their carpenter was in their community, who their plumber was in their community. And they looked up to them, and, and that, but, but that's all they see. So we gotta get them thinking, what it what it could be what it could mean to be a, a, a an iron worker a pipe fitter um, uh, an electrician working in, in the solar world you know so all of that takes education on many aspects both on the on the, on the contractor side and at the community level and the building trades of Alberta is a game to do that right across the board so I'll have to throw in a little bit of plug too. I just wanted to add I mean again my appreciation of hearing from Lyle as well as a tradesperson myself. And I think the challenges or the barriers are breaking down there, Lyle, is that uh, I don't think it's any secret that uh, at some time or back when I began as an apprentice, uh, tradespeople were seen as prima donnas uh, wherever they worked. And I think that the problem was, is that because they thought they were just more intelligent than everybody else, which is absolutely not true. And I think that stigma was even more forcefully put on uh, our indigenous peoples that they just didn't have the ability to be tradespersons, so therefore they were uh, laborers. And, and, and I think that the message that Lyle's saying, and obviously a lot of our oil and gas stuff is, is where uh, our indigenous peoples uh, are residing today, that they need those opportunities. You know, the final thing is that what I've always respected, as, as Lyle pointed out, our indigenous friends have great respect for our environment. And, and we could learn so much more from them. So I only see broader opportunities and more doors being opened the more that we bring Indigenous peoples into uh, these transitions into greener jobs so that uh, other workers that maybe don't have that opinion or had that education will learn from them. One of the things that we had talked about uh, was the importance of there being some leadership at the federal level to guide this crazy nation of provinces, territories, and nations within the nation that we have. And there's been some science and there's been some conversations and we've talked a lot about those, but there hasn't been much in the way of action. Um, and I think there's been some comments made about uh, a desire for a day of action on just transition. I think that's important for the people to raise their voices. And I think that uh, across the country, people speaking up that we want things to be better and we want uh, um, you know, to have the opportunities and we want action. We want to stop hearing talk about it. So Meg, if um, after this session ends and your phone rings and he's not too busy these days, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau gives you a call personally and says, you know, Meg, I think you were great on that panel, but what's the one thing that you think we should do to make just transition a reality in Canada instead of just a buzzword that I keep referring to all the time? I would say that something like, um, I know Ken mentioned a just transition minister, or like a just transition commission, something that can from the get go, um, like a, just like the clear commitment to it and that it's not just like a, you know, a buzzword or whatever, um, but something that can do the work that needs to be done to make it like cohesive at all the different levels and to make, uh, to make sure that it's not just sort of punted around to different um, agencies or levels of government. I would say, I don't know whether it's a, a commission or something that like mandates people actually work together and develop the, the goals that will lead to good worker and community outcomes. I had the opportunity to address the Minister of Labour a few months ago. The one thing that I take from that opportunity was we need to get the right people to be able to, to share with people, people in power like that, to, to share the realities of what's going on in our world. When we are able to look at labour and look at an opportunity to develop labour in a way that's going to see a, a, a new world develop for our young people. Because you got to remember, our workforce is, if you don't mind me saying, old and white. They're going to be retiring. Who do we backfill that with? 
And it has to be Indigenous people, and it has to be the women, it has to be New Canadians. All the groups that, that, that are currently within the boundaries of Alberta, and, and the only way we can do that is we have to make it known to not only, you know, what drives me up the wall is government is a different world for me. As an Indigenous person, being a liberal, being a, a conservative, it's out of my realm. I develop my relationships on the person. I don't take it to the point where, well, why are you getting along with him? That person's a, a conservative. Um, you know, people are people are people. And if they're good people, they're going to do good for their community. They're going to do good for all of us. But if I'm able to share opportunities as to where we can develop our, our labor and our young people, uh, we just need to sit down and, and have that dialogue on, on an ongoing basis, but not stop complaining and come up with some awesome solutions as to what we can do to, to make things happen in the future. I think the message has to be not just to Trudeau, but the federal government as a whole. We need to put things in gear and get things happening. And March 12, 2020, I was just flying back from Ottawa from lobbying our members of parliament on just transition. And two days later, we locked down the major parts of COVID protocols. So that was the end of that. But that's number one is... We as uh, environmentalists and as workers, we need to engage the lawmakers, the legislators, and tell them what they want. But if the reverse was going to happen and I was going to talk to the Prime Minister of Canada, I would say, and this may sound funny, never mind talking to the premiers of the provinces. We know that the politics in this country is divided. Talk to the municipal leaders the people that are elected directly by the working people in the communities, they have ideas, they want to keep their municipalities vibrant and working, and they're the people. Never mind the people that are sitting up on a legislative hill somewhere and have lost that connect to the workers. Talk to the municipalities and listen to what they say, and then put that into a viable legislative act that is going to get us back to work and make sure that nobody is left behind. One point that John Cartwright elevated a comment Councillor Mike Layton in Toronto brought up about the city of Toronto has taken some bold steps. They've passed some new rules. They're trying to get uh, retrofits done in homes. But his question was, well, who's going to build the million heat pumps that we need if we're going to actually get to that net zero by 2050? And why can't we be the ones that are building those? And I think some of the other panels talked a bit more about the importance or the idea of an industrial strategy and sort of how we need a new green uh, industrial revolution or something to that effect. It is those policies are generating change and our industry is not necessarily prepared to meet those changes at this point because we're still waiting for something to trigger that shift. Like someone answered in the comments, well, those are gonna be made in China and Germany because they're already ready. So we're in the transition, it's happening, and we're kind of just watching it slow roll past us, thinking it would be great if we could be part of that. An answer to that type of thing, like wh why aren't our workforces making these products that we are creating a demand for? Is it that the workers that want to do the building actually don't have the control, obviously. We, in Canada, you know, we, we want electric vehicles, but all of the uh, companies are not Canadian. So we kind of just have to roll with what's shipped. I know there's been great work Uniforce done in that area. This is a crucial question about how do we get to building the materials and making the changes that we actually need here instead of just creating either good jobs offshore or bad jobs offshore, frankly, uh, doing the work to build our green economy. There's so many different aspects of, of everything that we talk about today. Everything from how do we engage politicians and how do we ensure that we all take an active role to ensure that we that we look at this in the contemporary sense as ind Indigenous people. How do we take on just transition with, with, with a contemporary look at things, even though our, our, our environment is being damaged every single day? We're told to get people into the, into the oil sand, but at the same time, environmentally, we're, we're not supposed to um, by, by our elders. And so trying to juggle all of that to, to try and save lives of people who are trying to do good for themselves is a slippery slope because uh, how do we educate them who are, who, are, who are elders are telling them we shouldn't be doing this or, or yes, we should be doing it because it's, 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 it's the contemporary way of doing things. So in everything that, 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 that you're saying, all falls down 
to how we look at the environment and how we need to find that, as far as I'm concerned, that common ground where we all can see some opportunity to, to have a more greener future, but more importantly, include everyone to be a part of the building of it and sustaining it. I think that there's so many policy options. The question is, how do you actually like get an industrial policy? Like, How do you actually get put the pressure on to say like, hey, we need to have plans in place and policies in place where we're using um, materials that are made locally and that you can do things with sustainability criteria in um, like procurement, like in all of that, that kind of stuff. Um, if you have like, I think Ken raised it in his remarks, like, you know, explicit sort of uh, local work requirements and then it comes on under WTO attack. I mean, we need to care less about that, like being like uh, taken to task by the WTO. I know that our current government really cares a lot about that. There's so many opportunities to develop, you know, local workforces and to use it as, as ways to bring people into the workforce who historically have not had access to those types of jobs, all of that type of stuff. I think like it comes so to what Lyle said, like coming together and working together and making the demands. It's, uh, it's organizing. It's all these things. I feel like now I'm using some buzzwords and things like that. Like it's, it's just like, it's really hard to, for me to sit here and say, this is exactly what we need to do. But I feel like there are so many opportunities if we were able to get um, a true like industrial policy and one that has um, very like baked into it equity, equity goals uh, in communities. And then we're using local materials. We're using materials that are made that have lower emissions, all of that. Politicians need to want, the lawmakers need to actually want to do this. And I think someone said in the panel, like corporations are going to go to the lowest bidder. Um, you can do a lot to prevent that in terms of policy, but uh, it's still, that is like the fundamental problem of uh, capitalism, I guess. I did see that too. And I said, well, we could jet, let's just all agree to end capitalism tomorrow. And then we'll probably solve a lot of these problems, but that's not necessarily the message that's going to grow our movement per se. But I think those, those important points to that, because the things that capitalism does is it does externalize and it does leave out people and it, it's designed to do that in a certain way. So uh, definitely an issue and a challenge there that is bigger than today's conversation. It seems like we say that a lot. There's a lot of this that's bigger than just one conversation. And I think it's kind of an important point. Well, it is not going to be a good just transition plan if you don't have workers involved in the conversation. Uh, it's not going to be a good transition plan if it's also like siloed even with workers in there. There needs to be engagement. The community is where workers live and they elect the local officials and they do those things. So we do need to have it be workers and their communities engaged in these issues. The messaging that come out of a lot of this is that every time we think there's one group we need to target, we find that there's strings in that that link us all together. The types of things that we're arguing for, we can do so within the frame of labor, but everybody, whether they have a a uh, union job or not needs, you know, the, there's the hierarchy of needs that we should be trying to meet. And in a rich country like ours, there really shouldn't be this amount of poverty and these questions and thing. And I will allow you folks to rant, but I just feel like one great piece that we've talked about is like, we know certain things that need to be done. It would be great if we could just muster ourselves and pick up the tools and do it. Everyone knows that there are still far too many, because there's more than one, far too many First Nations communities without reliable sources of clean drinking water. This seems like something that we could fix with a green industrial plan pretty quick. You know, if we're looking to gear up and train people, why don't we teach them how to do that? Why isn't that on the top of our list of issues? Because that raises all boats, right? Uh, Jamie, I just wanted to make the point. The reason why I keep going back to that you need uh, workers uh, or worker representatives at the table when we're discussing about this is because we do that work. We understand uh, the complexities of how to make change. The, the challenge that we have is the majority of the corporations that Canadians work for are owned by Americans or Chinese or the Japanese. Canada itself doesn't have the sovereignty, if you will, of corporate ownership. So every decision that has to be made in Canada, whether we like it or not, and I don't like it, is that we have to discuss and assess what that impact's going to be on the people, the corporations that actually employ our citizens. Uh, the, you know, the question has been asked us, I don't know how many times that, 
well, why can't Canada just build their own car and sell it to Canadians? Well, we could do that. So once you've sold to the 38 million Canadians, and of course not all 38 million Canadians are gonna buy a car, uh, as opposed to the market across the border where there's 368 million Americans that are buying products, that equation doesn't work. And, and the same thing goes, but I thought there was a really good example of how you can change things uh, that, that Meg has yet to touch on is that I was watching the news the other day and Doug Ford uh, fell and bumped his head and decided to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into DeFasco steel mill in Hamilton to make it a greener, less uh, CO2 producing facility. That's the kind of work and why I always put the emphasis back on politicians. That's where politicians can lead the way that despite the fact that DeFasco is not owned by any particular Canadian, they can make that investment to make that positive change. And where the important thing of unions comes in is that, so the United Steelworkers has a Canadian region and an American region. And we have all, uh, Unifor does not have an American arm, but those that do, is important that they talk to those unions in other countries to build solidarity so that we as workers aren't competing against each other, that we're trying to find equitable, reasonable investments that keep us all working. And uh, darn it, if you don't know, corporations have been known to pit workers against workers. And so that's where that broader discussion in the trade union movement across North America or never mind North America, but across the world is important. And finally, I'll say that the emphasis on showing that that was the important thing to do was in the recent negotiations of the US MCA trade agreement. And uh, our national president was very much involved in that, but not because we are looking for something as just our trade union, but we wanted to ensure that there was language in that uh, multilateral agreement that gave Mexican workers a fair opportunity to keep a living wage and work in a safe workplace. And in the last couple of months, that's been happening. There's great transition happening. So it doesn't that we have any dislike uh, against workers anywhere. Workers are workers. But if we're going to tackle that global economy that wants to pit us against each other, then we're going to have to do it collectively together. I get all the things, that, the important things that Ken is talking about. It's awesome stuff. But also, and I say also because in, in conjunction with doing that, we need to start developing communities because right now there's a lack of that. And one, one clear example, it actually starts on Monday. We developed a relationship with the Paul Band just east of Edmonton. They have like five power plants right around their community. And when I went and checked, talked to their chief, chief and council, I said, why is there not a bus going to the community and traveling and dropping off workers to, to all of these power plants? And there's hardly anybody working at these places. And so one of the things that uh, Rob Calvert, my colleague, Terry Parker, all of us sat down and figured out an opportunity. What, what can we do? So what we ended up doing and starting on, on, on Monday, we're bringing in um, eight different trades that are going to be spending time with the junior high and the high schools and getting them, getting our young people starting to think about how they can get into and try eight different trades. And then from there, pick which ones, that, which one they want to get into so that they can go work and live in their community, but go work just outside of their community at a place that's, that's local for them. And, then, and that to me is, is community development. That to me is an opportunity to, to uh, work on, on, on a young workforce that's localized, but also trained well and, and, and an opportunity for them to, to just be at home. And meanwhile, 
what's going on in our communities is there's an incredible amount of, 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 of suicides. There's, there's all these neg negative things that, that happen. And it's our responsibility as adults. We all, and it doesn't matter what community that we're in. We are all responsible for our young people. And we have to take the time to give our young people opportunities for them to see uh, a path forward in a career. Uh, to, to, to help them to survive this world. I think sometimes uh, I get locked into this idea of a transition from something in the past into something new. The importance of what you've brought, I think, many times to this panel is talking about, like, let's start with these folks and let's bring these people into something that they, that they have not had these opportunities. And it's not the struggle of trying to find, fit someone else into something. It's like we have a generation of young people that are going to need to lead us. We will all benefit by giving them a hand up as opposed to just passing on the problems that we've created for them. And I think that that's a very important message. Now, I was thinking back, well, to what both Lyle and Ken just said, I'm thinking about sort of that investment into the PASCO um, and then sort of thinking about the investment into Algoma and then a, something that was raised by um, in one of the questions about that sort of being a very narrow view of um, just transition, A, that it's a technical fix and B, that it's only workers that are important, um, if I'm sort of characterizing that correctly. And I do want to just express that, um, well, I don't know, I, I know about the DePasco investment. I don't know if there are sort of larger community um, investments or in terms of worker training or attraction um, that have sort of equity goals, I would guess probably not. I do think that that is something that when the, when the union takes it on is essential. Um, it's not just, you know, the workers in that local, although we do have, we can't dismiss that either to say like, there are workers that are going to lose their job and they need sort of like immediate supports, but you have to broaden it beyond that um, into working with, you know, whether it's indigenous communities and certainly in Sault Ste. Marie, many of the members there um, our indigenous people and um, sort of that lo the locals there have been working on improving ties um, with indigenous communities and bringing in the membership, working more sort of in the community. So you would hope that sort of in response to that question that was raised, um, that the local would go beyond just sort of a very kind of narrow view or a technical view, both in terms of the environmental sense that um, just transition or reducing emissions isn't just like a technical fix. Like there's so much more to it. And I just think a lot about what sort of what Lyle's been saying about the importance of community and all of that. And then also to sort of pick up on another thing that Ken said is the, the importance of international solidarity, sort of building and working with workers and communities around the world. Because even if you have these investments, whether it's in Algoma or uh, DeFasco in Hamilton, where is the, the scrap steel that's coming in? Yes, there's a, a lower sort of emissions from that type of furnace uh, in the steel making process. But where, is, where are all the materials that are coming into it made? Um, are we looking at this sort of comprehensively in terms of supply chain, in terms of environmental impact? Is that sort of are the initial materials made with uh, labor that's not uh, treated fairly in other parts of the world? And so I know that like as steel workers, we do a lot of work internationally and, and uh, working with uh, miners worldwide and all sorts of things. And so I can't emphasize enough the importance of sort of bringing in all of those factors together. There was another question regarding the situation we have where for the last two decades, provincial and federal governments have felt the need to rely on foreign labor or bringing people in and paying them below what would be considered wages that are acceptable here, uh, rather than hiring people that are already here and could do the work and maybe build toward a career. Why do we have a foreign worker program when we have so many people within the country that likely would want these jobs? And it's just, there's like, is it just good old capitalism, finding the cheapest source of labor, and we just settle for that? Or is there a good benefit that comes from these programs that maybe I just don't know about? And in particular, they're saying, well, why wouldn't we just be hiring more Indigenous people and, and women instead of trying to hire foreign workers? Now, I know it's not every job is different, and there's different roles, but it just sort of speaks to, I think, maybe the larger problem of, of capitalism and how we're looking at this is we're not necessarily looking to create good jobs. We're just looking for cheap workers. I'll just say this. There's a lot of dynamics in that particular question. Uh, on the one side, and, and the go-to answer that we always hear from uh, business and politicians is that workers need jobs. And if they're coming from Mexico, for instance, uh, we can give them a little bit more money and they can sustain their families. That's very much true, Jamie. The nail on the head is that this is uh, a capitalist approach to exploit labor. I mean, there's probably 
examples all across this country. But the one that I know of is out of the community where I was born and raised, Windsor, Ontario. And there's a, a, a small community called Leamington that grows probably most of the tomatoes that you enjoy. And uh, they import uh, large amounts of workers from Mexico that work there year round because now it's all greenhouse growing products. Uh, but failing of that, especially through this COVID and still nobody has been held truly accountable to this is that they put these workers in bunkhouses, uh, 30, 40 of them into a bunkhouse to share one washroom. And we've had people dying of COVID. And the Ministry of Labor has done not just a poor job, but a dreadful, disgusting job of protecting those workers because somehow they determined that they do not fall under the protections of a Canadian board laborer. And that is exploitation at its worst. I think it has to be challenged. That foreign labor working program needs to have some challenges put forward on it. And some of those things should be addressed in my opinion, is that are we fulfilling the opportunities that may be provided uh, to people first and foremost? And then is everybody getting to work in a safe environment? In my opinion, the federal government has been allowed to use that as an exploitation of cheap labor. And that is why I continually target these politicians because how in the world are we going to have a just transition if they can't even ensure that foreign labor is being treated in a safe and healthy manner in this country? Where is that going to take us as workers start to fall out of their traditional jobs and need somewhere else to go? But I wondered if uh, we could just give uh, Lyle, Megan, Ken, 30 seconds to just, if there's any final thoughts you wanted to share with our, our audience. I've always been proud about the fact I have the face for radio. You know, so we with the with the BTA is in the process of talking about indigenous trade opportunities for for our people to uh, to get more in the trade, and we're actually working on a, on a, on a media deal to uh, have a uh, an ongoing um, uh, talk show to talk about opportunities in the trades, and uh, I would love for people to be able to watch out for that, and uh, that's something that's going to be coming in the spring, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing from people and and getting ideas as to how we can better this province in ensuring that we provide opportunities for not only Indigenous people, but new Canadians, women, um, Indigenous women, and uh, in ensuring that we break down the barriers to ensure that uh, every opportunity is given to anybody that wants to get into a career and to be an apprentice uh, in, in, a, in a career in the trades, that we make that available for them. I just want to say thanks for having me. I thanks for this discussion. I think it was excellent. And also for all the questions, I think that's um, they really made me think and uh, they were like super helpful when thinking ahead about um, what more action our union can take in terms of just the union, but also our community ties and all of that. So it's a quick message uh, and, and it's a labor activist message. Take the information that you got from this conference and do something with it. Do something. It is not good enough just to complain. Do something with this. Go visit your MPs and your MPPs, not on Parliament Hill, go to their riding offices where you can actually have an audience with them and demand that something changes. Do something. Thank you all of you for joining. Thanks for uh, putting up with the white out background that I have here and uh, wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you. Huge thank you, Jamie, to all of our panelists have been amazing since last night and all day today. I hope uh, everyone who's on uh, today has enjoyed uh, these discussions. I really agree, Ken, that one thing to have a conference to get educated and learn these things, but what we really need to be doing is now taking action. And this is an important time politically here in our country with a new Just Transition Act supposedly going to be coming. I will just flag, and I saw it was in the chat earlier. I know the Council of Canadians and 350.org have a day of action they're planning on March the 12th. So I suggest uh, people look into that. I also know, as I'm on the planning committee, that there is going to be a just transition 
a major stream and focus at the Broadbent Institute Annual Conference in Ottawa coming up on March the 30th and April, April 1. So if people are in that area, I think there's going to be some virtual options uh, to participate in that. So, so some additional uh, opportunities there to engage with people across this country in these important conversations. I want to thank all of our sponsors, uh, some of whom are represented here in terms of uh, Unifor and uh, the Prairie Region for supporting us, the Alberta Federation of Labour, the Building Trade of Alberta, and our corporate mapping project, which the Parkland Institute, CCPABC, CCP Saskatchewan, and the University of Victoria have been running for the last seven years. A lot of amazing research, a lot of great research networks across this country have come from that work. And this conference would not have been possible without the support of the Social Science and the Humanities Research Council, SHRC, uh, Connections Grant. So we really appreciate all that. As you've seen, we have many, many partners. The links on our website link to their pages. Um, you know, uh, Seth Klein's um, Climate Emergency uh, Network, um, tons of great uh, organizations, uh, Blue Green Canada, of course. Please connect with those organizations and support the work that they are doing. We need to be bringing the movements together from all different sectors of our society to, as we lead this transition moving forward. Parkland also relies on the support of uh, many organizations, unions, and individuals. So if people are able to support Parkland uh, for future events, we would really appreciate that. Thank you all. We look forward to uh, meeting you in person uh, hopefully over a glass of wine or beer or something lovely at uh, future events. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day.